It's been a, a great experience. Uh, today we have a, a terrific speaker here to, to kind of lay out some of the things that are happening with the different U.S. responses to China's rise, uh, specifically the view from the Hill and from our lawmakers. Uh, we really have a unique speaker, I think, who can really do a, a great job and kind of key us in on what's going up on the Hill and, and just the different focus there. Uh, so before we kind of introduce Congressman Forbes, I just would kind of like to lay out some of the, the gruel, ground rules, so to speak, of, of how we do these panels. And I think for everybody who's been here before, you kind of know how these things go. Uh, so basically, Congressman Forbes is going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to open it up to questions, Q&A. Uh, essentially, what we'd like to do is, is kind of keep the questions brief, maybe one to two, one, maybe one question each would be great with or a comment. Um, and that would be great. So if we could, I'd like to have Congressman Forbes take the floor. Thank you. Well, Harry, thank you. And thank all of you for the work that all of you've done in so many areas. And I'm just honored to be able to be here. Always good to be with the Admiral. And I listen to him uh, when he speaks because uh, he's got just a wealth of information. Am I messing up already? Did I call him just like oh, geez. Well, I said something wrong earlier on. That's <laughs> Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, but um, w we certainly appreciate this opportunity. And uh, Harry, I told at the beginning, um, uh, I read his article, I read many of you when you write stuff. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in the Armed Services Committee, I guess, is two things. First of all, we are the most bipartisan committee in Congress. And that helps uh, in a tremendous manner. And it's because of, I think, the leadership of both the ranking member and the chairman, that they try to make an effort to do that. I think our subcommittee on Sea Power, if you ask um, the individuals, Mike McIntyre, who's my ranking member, and I are not just uh, good colleagues, but we are very, very close friends. Uh, in fact, in uh, the election cycle, not the last one, but the one before last, the only example of a Republican being invited to a Democratic district to speak for that candidate or a Democrat being invited to a Republican district was Mike McIntyre asked me to come down and speak for him at his district, and I did. Um, and because uh, we have that kind of relationship, and I say that because it's a little different than what we normally uh, see uh, written and talked about in, in Washington. Second thing, I, I'm going to try to be relatively brief so I can get to your questions, but uh, I, I thought today what I'd like to share with you is maybe some observations, not about substantively what's going on with China and the rise with China, but from a congressional perspective. And maybe what I can offer you, because there's some brilliant brain power sitting around these tables, what maybe I can offer you is just a specimen that I can bring in that you can slice and dice and see, well, I understand why these guys think the way they do, or at least how they think. And, and I say that because it's important, because over and over again I'm seeing today, especially um, with uh, areas of national defense, that we tend to talk among ourselves in defense industry or perhaps in think tank groups. But none of that matters very much if we can't get to the policymakers who are making these decisions. And um, I remember a long time ago when I played basketball in um, high school, I had a wonderful coach. And one entire practice, the coach focused on one thing, a very detail oriented, but it was calling time out. And you, you would never think that, but the reason he said is, he said, I need those two seconds you will lose if you are just going up and putting your hands up in the middle of the court because the um, spectators aren't going to call time out. The court doesn't call time out. It's the officials that are calling time out. He said, so I need to, for you to get your hands up in front of those officials and call time out because it will save us two seconds or three seconds, which for making that last shot is important. And over again, I hear people who have wonderful lofty thoughts, but they're not getting to policymakers today who are living in 15-minute increments of time, and they're being pulled in so many different areas. And so what I thought might be a little insightful today is to kind of give you a genesis of how the China issue really started growing in, in China and to a large, I mean, in, in Congress, and to a large degree, it started with a codel that Congressman Ike Skelton, many of you might have remembered uh, Congressman Skelton, he was a chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Ike and I were very, very close friends. When he was a ranking member, 
he used to like to travel with me, and we would travel together a lot. And we went to China on a Codel. And I remember as we, our eyes were opened on that Codel because one of the things that was amazing to me is we recognized what the Chinese were doing in terms of their military. They were bringing their uh, steel plants um, at, at their shipyards to their ports where everything was coming together in a very logistical fashion. And when we spoke with them, you know, we kind of went over thinking, well, they've got all this inexpensive labor and stuff. Everything they were talking about was kind of cutting edge. How do we get the most out of our manpower? And it was a different world to us, but, but two things really happened. I was walking through their steel plant, and I looked at the thickness of their steel and what they were doing. And when I got back on the plane, I said, they're going to make aircraft carriers. And um, then I looked to Ike and I said, uh, one thing that seems to stand out here is they know so much about us, and we know almost nothing about them. I mean, every place we went, they knew everything about every member, every committee, where we on. And coming back over here, it, it, there, it wasn't there. So two things that we did. The first thing we did is we came back and we, uh, Ike and I asked our friends at the Pentagon, about what they were going to do in carriers, and at least what they told us. I'm not saying what they thought in the building. I can't answer. They said, no, no, they're not going to build carriers. That's, that's not the direction they're going. We said, oh, we think they are. And they said, no, not, that's not where they're going. They, they don't want to do that. Um, but the second thing is we literally went through every hearing we could see, every subcommittee we could find, and they were doing nothing on China. Then nobody was even asking the questions and exploring the things that we thought was important. So we formed the China Caucus, and, and our premise was this, that whether it was by guilt or by inspiration or by jealousy or competition, we would at least foster more inquiry, more debates, more discussions, and we had really hoped to be a clearinghouse for Congress, not that we would be pro-China or anti-China, but that we would be a clearinghouse of ideas. And it was amazing how it just took off. Um, it had exactly the impact we wanted. All of a sudden, other committees were thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to grab our jurisdiction. So they started having hearings. Um, other people said, well, we better get this group because we're pro-China and we, we want to make sure you guys don't go off on a deep end in the opposite direction. And then the anti-China people were saying, well, you may be too soft on, on where, where you are with China. But an interesting thing happened, some of which I can share with you and some I can't. When the whole Unical issue came up, which all of you remember, all of a sudden I'm getting a call from people that I didn't even know saying, you got to stop this issue, here's why it's so important. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, how do you expect me to do that? You know, I'm not the speaker, I'm not chairman of a committee, and they said, no, no, you're on the right path, you've got the, the right information, just, just sit tight and um, be, be ready to go when we need you. And the next day, six chairmen of committees called me and said, we're supposed to call you and find out what's going on with this issue. Can you brief us? And we did. And of course, you know, that thing kind of turned on its heels uh, on, on the House floor. The other thing that was really interesting was I had a call from top people in FDA and some top people with the Army um, looking at uh, uh, food safety issues. And they said, can we come in and meet with you? And I said, um, well, sure. I said, you know, um, I'm happy to meet with you. So they flew in from all over the country, came into my office, and they said, um, here's why we came. You're doing two big things. One, you're asking questions about China. And number two, you founded another caucus, the Modeling and Simulation Caucus. And they said, here's our big fear, uh, food safety. And they said, a lot of food products are coming in through paste. And we don't know where it's coming from, how it's getting in here. Even if the country of origin is labeled Canada or Mexico, it doesn't mean it's not coming from China. And we don't know if we can protect the quality. But then they pointed out some interesting things. Largest example of food poisoning in the country, they asked me if I knew what it was. Of course I didn't know what it was. Um, this was the Army. You know who's looking at it. They said it was salmonella poisoning from... Um, Premix ice cream trucks, and they said uh, our big concern is two things: one, terrorist activity that could impact that; 
But secondly, even if it's not terrorist, even if it's accidental, the problem is in today's world, we can't even track where the source of it is until we have too much um, uh, of a negative impact that's taken place. And we want you to help us create the modeling and simulation capabilities and look at the China connection on this so that we can monitor where these activities came from. And, and so then kind of we fast forward to um, Ike and I did a number of different uh, briefings and things that, that we, we did from there that we tried to spur activity. But Ike was always so wonderful. After he became chairman, he was just a, a wonderful man. It, you know, national interest was his important thing. And every time we would get classified briefings, Ike would be such a gentleman. We would walk in, and the first thing Ike would say to the briefers is, when it comes to China, there is no Republicans and no Democrats, and Randy's going to ask all the questions. And he, then he would just slide back in his chair and, and, and let me go. And we, we came to recognize that China, one of the things we love to do here is we love to put people and countries in categories. We love to say they're all good or they're all bad or this is their goal. But anyone who tries to do that to China, we realize you, you just totally miss the boat. It is a multifaceted um, country with multifaceted goals, and it's not all driven by, you know, one uh, monolithic uh, overarching um, scheme that's taking place in there. And if, if you move us forward to where we are recently, we had, as you know, the administration had this pivot to the Asia-Pacific area. That was pretty much in nomenclature. It was, we could all debate in here whether it was a pivot, whether it was actually it ever we'd ever left there. I mean, that's a, that's a good debate. But one of the things that we recognize is the administration might have made the pivot, but Congress had never made the pivot. Um, and, and if you feel more comfortable, we'll use the word rebalance. You know, it's, it's whatever nomenclature you want to use. But so, so we went to the chairman of the Armed Services Committee and we said, we need to, to not just look at today. One of the things I think we do very difficult in our country is we go to the squeaky wheel, but we're never looking at 10 years down the road and five years down the road and 15 years down the road. And I said, uh, tomorrow it's not going to be Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going to need to have had our hands around the whole Asia-Pacific area. And, and I said, we really need to be focused on doing that. And they basically said, well, we don't have the resources and the time. We're, we're committed to all these other things. And I said, well, let us kind of work on putting this together, and to his credit, the chairman said, okay, uh, do it. And so we started working with other subcommittees, we started working with other committees, and we created this series to begin to look and examine the whole Asia-Pacific pivot, where we need to be, not just today, but five, ten years down the road, and also to see if we could make the connection between the thinkers, the people that are looking at this, even our friends at the Pentagon, and between policymakers who are actually going to have to have some say at some point in time in making those decisions. And it's been incredibly uh, beneficial, I think, and helpful for us. And, and just a couple of last observations, and then I'll flip it back over to Harry so I can get to your questions. I, I think one of the things that bothers me enormously is for all of you who I know have been experts in studying history and studying where we are today, there have always been the game changers that oftentimes we fought against as government. Um, you could take something as simple as the Colt revolver that the federal government laughed at and thought it was a weapon that would be of no use, and of course they canceled their contracts with Colt and forced him to go bankrupt until a, you know, a handful of Texas Rangers who were kind of weird, unique individuals uh, came and found Colt and said, no, no, this, you're exactly right. This is the only thing that we can do to kind of be a game changer out west. And that's when he went, you know, from the five shot to the six shot revolver. And it was actually called the Walker Colt, um, you know, uh, revolver that came out. But it transformed uh, warfare that you had in the west. And it also transformed um, Texas and things that were going on there. And yet we would have never pegged it, you know, 
if we had a Pentagon at that time looking at it. Um, if you go to the Higgins boat, all of you know just a perfect example. We laughed at that and said, no, no, we don't, we don't want that. And, and yet Higgins said, no, no, this is what you're going to have to have for a landing craft. And he developed that. And, of course, we all know Eisenhower, when he met him, said, so you're the man that won World War II. And later said, if it hadn't have been for that design, we'd have had to have a totally different strategy. You can look at when we went from sail to steam and everybody fought it. You know, uh, that, that's not where we want to go for our ships uh, and from wood to steel. Uh, the big um, discussions, our aircraft carriers were originally just going to be surveillance um, vessels, you know, that we never thought we would really be able to launch strikes off of those. And, and, and what I worry about today is when I'm looking at China and I'm looking even at Russia today, it's not that we want to make them our enemy, but it's that if we aren't smart and aren't looking and analyzing, constantly putting things on the table, I don't want to wake up five years from now and had a game changer that all of a sudden we were asleep at the switch because we just didn't want to tackle this because it was too tough. It was an issue we don't didn't want to look at. What's the game changer? the Colt for tomorrow, the Higgins boat for tomorrow. Is it directed energy? Is it our vulnerability in space that we might have? Um, is it that we need to go back to redundant navigation systems? You know, all of those things are things that we want to put on the table and begin to ask and, and look at. And, and I'll kind of conclude with saying, as I look at um, where, where we're going with the whole Asia Pacific area, the big void there is a lack of a strategy. Harry wrote that article on are we just having a hedging strategy. It was appropriate. It was a good article. I'm not just telling you that. But I will tell you, every expert I have before my subcommittee, I ask them, do you know of a strategy that we have that you can articulate today? And every one of them say no. And we have a guidance. But an 11-page document to do our procurement with and the stuff that we have, and here's kind of my view into the future. If you look at where China is today, they're not 10 foot tall. We make a mistake to make them 10 foot tall, but they're not three foot tall, you know, and they're growing and they're investing heavily in their military of tomorrow. And if you just look at the curve lines, our curve lines are going down, their curve lines are coming up. Now, I don't know if you could pick imaginary statistics and say we're three times stronger than them or five times stronger. I don't know. But here's what I know if immediately I take off the table and say we're not just defending the Asia Pacific area, we're defending a global um, area. So that takes a huge part of our force away automatically. If I have a game changer that enters into it, cyber, uh, space, whatever, all of a sudden I've changed, the, I've changed the dynamics again enormously. And one of the things that I see happening is China's not going to be here with this uh, enormous um, uptick curve for 30 years. Best experts we've had, you guys may have a lot better insight on that, peg it at about 10 years. They've got pollution problems that they're going to be facing. They've got corruption problems. They've got uh, job creation problems. Y you know all the set of problems that they have. But there is this 10-year set of window, th this 10-year period that, that we have to deal with. And I feel like this, I think we have to have a strategy for two reasons. One is it's going to be important that our allies come alongside of us. And, and I have had more ambassadors, more prime ministers, more relatives of prime ministers that are lining up at my door every day saying, can we talk to you because we don't know what the strategy is, administration's not making it clear to us, and we want to come alongside of you with our procurement decisions, but we don't know what to do. And as you know, their procurement decisions are not faucets. They turn on and off. They're, they're five, ten-year decisions that they have to make. That's why strategy, I think, is vitally important. And the second part of it, we walk in with some natural weights that we have to carry that perhaps China doesn't have to carry. One of them is our health care costs. We just pay more in health care costs um, for um, our defense than, um, than we have, th than the Chinese are going to have to pay. But the other thing is just uh, overall compensation in general. Now, both of those are politically very, very difficult to deal with, and I don't know that we'll successfully deal with them. But it just makes good sense to me that if we are in a situation where the Chinese are not our enemy, 
but certainly our competitor, and they view us as their competitors, we ought to at least be looking at some cost imposition strategies that maybe we could be putting out there to help even the playing field just a little bit over this 10-year decade period of time. So having said all that here, I hope I didn't take too much time. I'd love to throw it out now to your, your questions, and I'll try to respond as best I can. Excellent. Thank you, Congressman Forbes. Uh, so we have mics on, I believe, left and right that are portable that will come to you. Uh, if you could basically state your name and affiliation, that would be great. Um, so let's open it up. Jacob Heilbrunn, our, our editor at the National Interest. Thank you for coming, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, today in the New York Times, President Aquino of the Philippines is quoted as saying that the circumstances his country faces are analogous to Czechoslovakia in 1938. Do you agree? Well, I don't know that they're analogous to that. I think one of the things that we do see from our friends in the Philippines is, is two, th two things. One, I think that they're very, very concerned about um, the ramp up that they have seen from the Chinese in, in terms of territorial disputes that are, that are taking place. I think the second thing is that we see a great deal of commonality between what we could do with the Philippines and it is not asking for them in support of um, acquisitions because, you know, they're just not going to be able to come to the table with very much in that regard. But I think they can give us access, and access could be very, very important to us and very, very important to them. So I've seen a move uh, with um, the Philippines right now that recognizes a concern they've not had probably in the last decade. I think it's based on real things that they are seeing. Uh, on the ground and in the water that's taking place. Um, I think they are seeing this huge move uh, that they feel China is making. I think it opens up great opportunities for us right now in terms of doing things that, that uh, the two of us can work together on. And the primary thing is going to be the access that they can give us. And we have been actually talking to them about that and will continue uh, to do that. And my suspicion is we'll find the administration doing the same thing. Great question, Jacob. Thank you. Who else? Sir. Yeah, Mark Thompson of Time. Thank you, Congressman. Hey, Mark. Um, you have a great interest in aircraft carriers. Is China's anti-ship DF-21D a Colt revolver 10 years down the road? It's Colt revolver today. Um, I, one of the things that we looked at um, – and, and, you know, the other thing, two, two things, Mark, on that. One is people ask us, how did you get involved in China? I really, if you look at my district, I don't have a district-driven thing that, that put me here. Um, so it, it wasn't uh, anything that drove us there. If you look at our carriers, um, we started several years back. In fact, I had um, appropriation that I put in back in the good old days when we could actually do our jobs and have earmarks and things put in. wasn't anything driven from my district, but we just basically told the Navy, here's um, – I forgot it was 10 or $14 million, but we said, go find a fix for this, you know, because at that particular point in time, we weren't, we weren't finding one. I, I think it's not I, – I think I worry about not just where they are today with that weapon, but also where they could be tomorrow as we get, you know, different generations coming off of it. Uh, the, the two big concerns, it pushes our carriers back uh, further and further, and I, and I think that's one of the reasons we're going to have to look more at unmanned – um, capabilities is how we integrate those in. I think the other thing that um, it, it concerns me about is the dollars, um, the cost of building a carrier versus the cost of one of those missiles. It's a huge gap in between those, so we can't outrun them on that. And um, so I think it's very, very important. But I would say this. I think that has been something that's, that's a bit of a game changer to, to, uh, to impact us. But I think we can overcome that if we don't go to sleep and we look at some other um, systems that could be equal game changers uh, to turn the tide back in, in our favor. What I worry most about is we are beginning to settle now on budgets and things with national defense. And once you start settling, you aren't pushing the research and development cost and things that are looking for that cult that we can have. So I've never been afraid of the cult. I've always been the one that wants to have the cult, you know, and find it. And if I could give you one other example that was kind of an enlightening thing to me, several years ago on the modeling and simulation 
um, caucus that we were doing. I had a friend of mine from MIT who did a lot on modeling and simulation. And um, he would go around the world speaking on, on those topics. And as you guys know, modeling simulation really was probably next to NASA the biggest magnet we had for drawing kids to, for math and science, you know, which was a huge um, thing for us at the time. But, but he told me whenever he would go anywhere to speak, he would have about 250 engineers that would show up. He said when he went to China to speak, he had 5,000 engineers that showed up, and they were asking him cutting-edge questions, working on cutting-edge projects. And he said the reason we didn't know about it is because they don't travel to international conferences, so we couldn't measure it before. So, so what I'm afraid of, Mark, is not that we can't do it if we focus our energies. I'm afraid if we lull ourselves into sleep, we're going to have additional cults being turned out uh, that's going to be difficult to deal with. Excellent question. Thank you. Please, Jeffrey Kemp. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Kemp here at the Center for the National Interest. Um, uh, Congressman, it's, it's, it's often said that one of the constraints the United States faces in dealing with all these territorial disputes in the China seas, um, and particularly you get this from the, from the U.S. Navy, is that we have not ratified the law of the sea and the obstacle are a few senators. To what extent do you in the Congress, who seem to have very bipartisan views on this subject, can you put pressure on the Senate to finally ratify the law of the seas, and do you think this is important? Jeffrey, I couldn't put pressure on the Senate to do a budget for four years, so <laughs> it'd be very unlikely that I would be able to succeed in getting them to do a treaty. I think sometimes we look at particular things that we may feel we should do, and we say, unless we do this, we can't possibly succeed. I think sometimes where my focus is is to continue to put things on the table that we can do. And so right now in these territorial disputes, I think we first of all need to be saying we do need to have some strategy of how we deal with it and, and look at them. because. That's kind of the new norm of where we are. I mean, it used to be we'd focus everything on what was going to happen in Taiwan. You know, well, that, that's kind of morphing into these territorial disputes. And, and I think one of the things that we forget, even if we can't get a treaty that we think might be important, we can argue whether it is or not. But one of the things we need to do is we need to keep, I think, the Chinese busy in other areas. And oftentimes that's the best thing we can do. And one of the great things we can do, and we have it there, it's a chip shot, it's something everybody agrees with, just have to do it, is our allies. I mean, one of the things we've done on this is bringing our ambassadors together and letting them talk in, in forums with, with each other and with us. I think the Admiral will, would, would back me up if, if to the extent that we are communicating our strategies with our allies. They're making procurement decisions. It is keeping the Chinese really nervous, really busy spending money in other areas and making them at least question these territorial disputes and where they're going because every time they overreach, they make a new friend for us and, and they, uh, they help that friend to embrace us more. And I think though what we want to do is continue to stir that pot um, by making sure we're um, reinforcing our alliances that has actual teeth in it as opposed to just being in nomenclature where we are. So whether we get that treaty through or not, I, Lord only knows what the Senate does. You know, you know, we got 50 percent of people in the Senate think they should be president of the United States. The other 50 percent think they are president of the United States. It's just very, very difficult. But, but what we can do is I think there are other things we can get common ground on that we can say we should be doing this and what's logistically keeping us from doing it. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Professor Tooney, please. Um, I want to ask you a question about the relationship between the near and the Far East. Uh, some people wonder how much South Korea and Japan will trust us if we don't live up to our obligation to Israel and Saudi Arabia. Well, I, I think um, credibility is always an important, whether it's Saudi Arabia or whether it's um, Egypt or wherever it might be. I think living up to your promises, I anytime you don't live up to those promises and those commitments, I think you've kind of put a little swipe in the foundation of relationships. I think right now 
the South Koreans. I, I think we, we've got a, probably one of the better relationships we've ever had with Japan right now. I, th I think the key thing for us to do is continue to um, encourage that relationship. I think the key thing, I think, with the Japanese right now from, from all of my discussions with them is is being able to communicate that joint strategy with them being able to come alongside of them with joint procurement decisions that work in harmony. And I think that relationship is moving in a very, very good direction. And I don't think one single blow is going to change that relationship uh, at this point in time. I think South Korea, a little bit different situation, but I think I think they're recognizing the overreach um, of, of the Chinese, and that's, that's made them kind of come back, I think, a, a little closer with where we are. You know, this uh, identification zone, uh, the Chinese were taken back by the South Korean response to that. And so I feel both of those relationships, in fact, I feel that most of our allies in there, we're moving towards good relationships with them now. But I think we have to continue to show that we're going to honor our promises. But the biggest thing we need to do for them is to, to be very clear in what our strategy is and what our foreign policy is, not to make them have to look at the fine print um, and then come alongside of them so we can integrate in, in our procurement decisions. And I'll tell you, this is something that, that, I, that some people differ with me. I really think that we should move to um, more sales of um, acquisition items to some of our allies. They don't have to be as sophisticated as what we have, but it just makes good sense for us. It cuts the cost down for what we're expending, but it also brings them into a relationship with us where we need each other for 10 years, 15 years out for parts and everything else we're doing. I think that's something we need to explore um, in a greater uh, way than we've been doing it. Excellent question. Uh, we had one question in the corner right there, please. Thanks. I'm Rudy DeLeon from the Center for American Progress. In a previous life, the staff director of that great bipartisan uh, Armed Services Committee staff in the House. Yeah, thanks for your work, Rudy. Back in the 80s. You raised an excellent point, Mr. Forbes, and that is with the Pentagon bureaucracy, how do you get the debate focused on the readiness needs today versus thinking out into an environment that is going to be 10 or 15 or 20 years and much different, much more sophisticated where the different ways of thinking, like the cult, um, you know, is right now not not in the in the mainstream. How to how to generate that kind of discussion? Rudy, excellent. That's an excellent question. And and if I could take you back to when you were there, and maybe the sea change that's taken place. When you were there, you remember, and and a lot of folks in the Pentagon today still live in that world. It's I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes we don't recognize sea changes that have taken place. The sea change that's taken place is back when you were there, everything was done with chain of command. So if I were, was looking at strategies or procurement decisions or whatever, you kind of walked up that chain of command uh, through the military. It got to the Pentagon, you know, Secretary of Defense kind of massaged it, went to the White House, they put the political arms around it. Then it came to the chairman of the committees. And whatever the chairman did, so let it be written, so let it be done, was kind of what happened. That world is totally gone today. And so what you see today is, an, is two big cleavers that went to that, that world. One of them was doing away with earmarks. Uh, when you did away with earmarks, which I think was a foolish decision, I'll just tell you that, because the earmarks itself was not the problem. The problem was having these conference committees where you would pull stuff and airdrop it in that never had, was never vetted and never debated. But Congress actually could find that missing acorn every once in a while where they would say, maybe this is a project we need to do. Well, that's gone now. So you don't have um, members on the committee anymore who have a pride of authorship in the bill where they say, yeah, I want to support this bill and I want to help it because I I've got some fingerprints in it. The other thing is now, when bills get to the floor, you have two sides that have coalesced. One, the far left, which has always said we want to cut defense, and I'm not judging them. I'm just saying it, it is what it is. Now you have people on the far right who just want to cut it because they're very myopic on just budget issues and getting them under control. I'm not saying either side doesn't have valid concerns, but what happens is when it gets on the floor, you are having um, amendments that are flying for $100 million here and $200 million there. 
that nobody understands what the amendment is, and you literally have 10 minutes to um, talk about that amendment. Now, the, the problem with the Pentagon has been this. When you take something like sequestration, which was an incredibly stupid idea, you know, I mean, I fought against it from the day it, it was proposed. I looked the speaker in the eye and I said, you can't deliver what you're saying you can deliver, you know, on this. It's going to hurt national defense. But we pleaded, I mean, if I could use the phrase, beg, borrowed, it, and I would have stolen if I'd known what to steal, for folks at the Pentagon, just come over and tell us how bad this is going to be so we can describe this to policymakers. Crickets, nothing, not, not a word, you know, that was coming out. So then when we come in there and make these arguments, um, we would have our colleagues saying, no, no, the people at the Pentagon are being quiet, so it must be okay with them and we can make even further cuts. Um, what I would suggest we need out of the Pentagon initially is the realization, which I think is starting to get there now, sea change, can't just work with, you know, the chain of command, got to work with all these people and educating them. Second thing, we can't talk in the speak we always use. You know, I, I was... Um, at a meeting the other day and the CNO was there and he and I were having a discussion. My wife looks over to me and she said, do you guys ever talk in anything other than in acronyms? You know, um, and, and we have to make sure we're not using terms like reset and all of these kind of things because we're losing policymakers and we're using, losing the public in about 11 seconds, you know, and we've got to paint that picture better. Um, but then I think we have to insist and keep saying, just like the old advertisement, where's the beef? We have to say, where's the strategy? And, and, and I'll back that up with this. I, had one, I, I have voted against many of these budgets, and I think I'm the only person in the House or the Senate that did it purely for national defense and told them that. But I had one of the folks that had written one of these budgets, a wonderful person, a dear friend of mine, came to me and said, we need you to vote for this budget because if you don't vote for it, the fence guys are going to be looking at it, and they're going to say, oh, my gosh, it must be bad if you're not voting for it. And I said this. I said, if you will show me the analysis that you did between a national strategy and how this budget gets us to defend the United States of America, I'll vote for the budget even if I disagree with your analysis. And he looked at me and said, you know we didn't do any analysis. And I said, that's my point. So I think we have to practice what we preach. But what I would, I would say to the Pentagon, you've got to realize it's a sea change. You've got to change your language, you got to be willing to come talk to policymakers, and then you've got to start developing strategies that are more than six hours old. You know, they've got to stretch out 10, 15 years. And the other thing I'll pat you on the back about, in that era when you were over there, we did that. We did that to the Soviet Union. You know, we, we did those planning. We looked at cost imposition strategies. We're not doing that today, and we need to get back to that. Excellent, excellent. Uh Gentlemen, right there, please. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us today. I'm at Andrew Oros from Washington College and at the East West Center, Washington. Um, you, you've brought up several times this idea that uh, the U.S. is not well conveying what our strategy is in, in either in the region or, or regarding China. I mean, in my, in my sense, the, generally, the strategy, U.S. strategy is a, is a hedging strategy where we're trying to pull China into respecting international norms and contributing more to the existing order while preparing for the worst, if necessary, and uh, trying to get U U.S. allies to help us prepare uh, for the worst and also to help socialize China more. Um, what, what is it that, that you're hearing when these ambassadors come speak to you that is not being conveyed well? Or what is it about U.S. strategy specifically that you think is being misunderstood? Um, Andrew, I don't think I'm um, trying to be flippant about this, but it's kind of like, oh, yeah, we're for world peace and we're for all of us living together and getting along and singing Kumbaya. You know, that's wonderful as kind of a top line, um, one liner that I can give in a speech to people. Oh, that makes sense to me. But how do I base decisions on whether I'm going to have 11 carriers or 10 carriers? Or how do I know how many submarines I'm going to have? Or how do I know whether I'm going to put more money in research and development? What kind of training capabilities do I need to put out? You can't do it on that kind of cliche-ish discussion that you just had. Although, granted, we, we hear it a lot of times. So if you ask 
any of the people that come before my subcommittee, what I have to do is turn to them just like I would you. And I said, Andrew, show me your strategy. Give, give it to me so it helps me with procurement decisions on what I have to buy. If you can only give me what you've just said, that doesn't help me on any of those decisions I have to make. You know, I've got to get a little more specific than an 11-page guidance to be able to do that. And so when I have these ambassadors sitting with me, they're saying, we need to go this way or that way on a procurement decision. How do I know which way we kind of complement overall where you want to go? What kind of air wing base are we going to have? I mean, what's the mix we're going to have? Are we going to have U-class in there? Are we going to have um, uh, fourth generation, fifth generation? You know, you got policymakers right now that are saying, oh, well, we need more fourth generation planes because they're cheaper than the fifth generation, and yet we'll have folks at the panel rightly say, no, no, I'm going to protect my fifth generation because if I put a fifth generation against a fourth generation, fourth generation will always lose. You know, so Andrew, what I think we need is what all these guys know we need. I mean, they know we need more specificity. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling we tell them everything we're doing. They just need a better roadmap than what we're giving them right now. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be sitting there asking me over and over again, do I go this direction or I go this direction with my procurement decisions? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, right there, please. mentioned territorial issues but not history issues. The other day an NHK Board of Governor member said that Chiang Kai-shek had lied about the Nanjing Massacre and more importantly said that the United States used the Nanjing Massacre fabrication to cover up its own quote massacres, the fire bombings of Tokyo and the bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, the cabinet secretary said, well, those are his own opinions. The Japanese government refused to refute them. I would just say, I've lived in Taiwan, China, and Korea. The only place where people ever said nice things about the Japanese largely was in Taiwan. But, oh, and okay, Chiang Kai-shek is controversial, but his statue's still in Taipei. And the government that faced the onslaught of the Japanese army in 1937 in Nanking, it was the KMT capital of China. Now the KMT is in Taipei. So alienating your best friend in the neighborhood doesn't seem a good strategy. It also, I, I would just say last, about two weeks ago, Kyoto News contacted me and asked me to find a, a letter from Chairman Hyde, who I worked for. I worked on the Foreign Affairs Committee for 12 years. He had written the Japanese ambassador in 2005, where he upheld the Tokyo Tribunal. He was concerned about Yasukuni and the, uh, those who say the tribunal was Victor's justice. And Henry Hyde said that the, the Tokyo tribunal is no more Victor's just, ju judge, uh, justice than the judgment at Nuremberg of the Nazis. So my question to you, how can we have a comprehensive strategy in Asia? OK, everyone knows that in Tokyo, officials repeatedly agitate the Chinese and the Koreans, but now th they are tolerating statements about uh, the KMT in Taipei and about the United States and our own involvement in the war. So how can we have a strategy when this is going on? Well, first of all, Dennis, it's not how can we. We, we have to have a strategy in that. And the second thing is I am never going to be in a position where I can make sure that every statement that every leader of a country makes is completely acceptable and plausible to every other leader. That's a world that's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's not important, but let me just say this to you. One of the things that I would agree with is when I'm talking about strategy, I'm not talking about just military strategy. I think it needs to be across all of our agencies. That's why in July I wrote a letter to Susan Rice and I asked her to do a top-down review of all of her agencies and put together that strategy because this has to be a holistic approach. Um, and basically they didn't do that, but then we put it in the, the budget bill that just came out where they're going to have to do that strategy. That's one. Second thing, though, that I, that I want to point out to you, and I'm not dodging the issue, I'm just simply saying, I sit on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, the Foreign Relations Committee may deal with many of those same issues that you're talking about. My role has to be to make sure when the President of the United States, whoever that President might be, when all that diplomacy doesn't work, when it, when it has failed, that we have the military capability that I'm not walking into a situation where I've got a cold, I've got a Higgins, but on the other side of that situation. So I'm obviously going to be skewed, Dennis, a little more 
into looking at that type of strategic goal because that's the lane I run in. But I'm not saying that the discussion that you raise isn't very, very important force to have in the Foreign Relations Committee, and that's one of the reasons in this whole Asia-Pacific series we have had joint hearings with the Foreign Relations, which has never really happened before, to try to look at some of that overlap. If I might just sure. add, I would just say, um, two years ago, Ms. Ross Lehman was going to Seoul, and the Korean government said, oh, I'm sorry, you cannot meet Defense Minister Tim Guam Jin, who's going to Tokyo to sign a, an agreement on exchanging intelligence information between our two allies. Then they contacted her a week later and said, oh, the Korean people's feelings are hurt. Kim Kwang Jin is not going to sign that agreement, so you may meet him in Seoul. So my point, unlike Europe, where these history issues have been put be in the past, we have two allies in Asia. We do not have a regional organization like NATO, and we have two allies that don't talk to each other. So that is a military issue as well as diplomatic. It, it's a huge issue, but Dennis, I'll just conclude with saying I have the Korean ambassador and the Japanese ambassador and the Philippines ambassador and the Australian ambassador, all of them in my office, knocking, and they're all saying the same things. You know, and, and they understand, despite those frictions that are there, how important it is that we all have this alliance together in the Asia Pacific area for everybody. So I think there are things that we can do uh, and we have to kind of move forward, as I said at the beginning, with the things that we can find common ground on. Excellent discussion. One more question, please. Uh, sir, right there, right, right in the middle. Thanks. Uh, Joe Bosco, formerly with the Defense Department. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for your appearance today. Thanks, Chair. You stressed, of course, the need for strategy. And in the area of military strategy, could you comment on the viability or the advisability of the air-sea concept that's coming out of the Defense Department? Well, Joe, I think that, first of all, the thing that I would emphasize is the last word that you said, concept. Um, you know, it's not uh, really a strategic thing. It is a concept that we're, we're looking at. And, and I think the biggest problem with the air-sea um, uh, concept has been that when it was rolled out, we didn't do, and I'm using that's kind of the English we, you know, um, none of us did a very good job of really defining what that was and making sure everybody knew. So I think some people felt that it was some kind of war plan against China. I think other people felt it was, you know, a, a strategic plan for the entire Asia Pacific area. And really, if you listen to the individuals working on it, they've made very clear before our subcommittee, it is a concept. It is something that uh, they feel they could use equally in Iran or in the Asia-Pacific area or wherever they are. Um, I feel like at this particular point in time, Joe, that it is moving forward. I think some people are putting some good energy behind that. And um, we are constantly trying to stay on top of that with the briefings to make sure it's headed. But I think you've got some talented people working on it. I think if there's been any weakness at all, it has been in our inability to really define what it actually was and what its intent was. We tried to do that through hearings to maybe put this record straight um, a little bit, but I think we've got more work ahead of us um, in, in doing that. And with that, oh, please. Can we do one more quick one? Sure, sure. Please answer. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Secretary Blinken and I were talking about the Dempsey asked uh, uh, Moises Naim, who has a new book out called The End of Power, to come over and talk to all the, all the, force, or the, the service chiefs and the command commanders. Um, I, I think it was a wonderful meeting, uh, and, and, but uh, Naim uh, believes that the instruments of power with which we are familiar and have used not just military, but uh, other elements of power are in decline. And the kind of tools that we need in the world that is emerging are different kinds of tools. Uh, he spoke of the two most transformative military instruments in the last decade or so being drones and, and, and IEDs as examples. But <coughs> um, now, I put myself in this group. Uh, these fellows are of my tribe. And we are <coughs> comfortable with the instruments of power that we know and understand. And we, we're product improvement guys. 
we want better F-22s, or we want better submarines, or we want better carry about groups. <coughs> uh, there are no Jeff Bezos among us. None of us think about something totally different, breakout sort of technologies. Uh, Newt Gingrich has got a wonderful new book out, Breakout, exactly about this. But the prison guards keeping us in the past, and I think we're probably mostly prison guards, may thwart the very opportunity to make these kind of breakouts that the nation really needs. I think that often in history we have found our civilian leaderships force us into some breakouts. Uh, Roosevelt demanded of, 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 of Marshall to do what Marshall poured the idea of 80,000 airplanes per year. He didn't want to do that. Roosevelt was right. Marshall wasn't. Where are our political leaders? And this is my question, and it's not, I'm in league with you guys, but uh, 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 how can you, or are, are, are you building the kind of guys in your world that, that know enough and are thinking ahead enough that they can force guys like me to break out, to get away from the things that we know and are, and that are comfortable with? Wonderful question, um, and, and the answer, if I had to say yes or no, would be no. But let me qualify what I mean by that. First of all, I, I would take a little bit of issue with the premise, and that is that we need to force guys like you to break out of where you are. I think that we love in our country um, to be either all left or all right. We love to say it's either old school or new school. The reality is what always does best for us is a mix of the two. So in other words, it is foolish for me to leave behind the wealth of legacy knowledge that I have. Perfect example is this. We may come to a time if space is vulnerable, if we have cyber attacks, where we wish we knew how to do um, charting again for navigation because it's a redundant capability that's in there. So one of the things I continue to ask is are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Should, you know, I go on uh, some of our LCSs now, we don't have any charting anymore. You know, it's all electronic, you know, that's there, which is great. I mean, you know, if I were operating a boat, that's what I'd want to do, but if that goes out, you know, we don't even have capability sometime to go back to those redundant systems. So I think it's something we don't want to lose track of that. What we don't want to do is in the process of missing that Colt, missing that Higgins thing in the, in the process. And it's always come not easy. It's a birthing process that we come and we sit down at the table and we kind of push each other, you know. And part of that breaking out that you're talking about is kind of a holding back from people who also might want to run off too far down uh, the path with what's new because it runs our cost up so much we can't even afford to do it. Let me come back to what I think is the more important things, and that is this new, or the leaders that are there. I don't think they're there. I mean, you know, we had Carl Vinson. It wasn't just Roosevelt. It was Carl Vinson before Roosevelt who basically comes out and says, hey, I don't care if it's only 7% of the people in the country that want to build a Navy again. We've got to build a Navy. Uh, I have people all the time that are telling me, look, only 7% of the people care about national defense in this country. But I'll tell you, that figure will be 97% if we have a conflict somewhere and it's too late. So we've got to be those voices. Here's what frightens me as much as anything else. Um, the, the, the situation in Congress today is that we are not having the debates that we need, and our leadership on the Republican side and the Democratic side is not weighing in on these issues. When, when we looked at sequestration and we looked at where that could take us, I pleaded, I begged our leadership, Republican and Democrat. We had all of our subcommittee chairmen, Democrats and Republicans and ranking members, write letters to our leadership that said just this, just get the classified briefing on what sequestration is doing. And then if you come in and say, you guys are crazy, you're warmonger, what, what do you want to tell us? And you disagree with this, it's okay. But for goodness sake, don't go be making these slashing decisions without at least getting the briefing. To my knowledge, only one of all the leadership, House and Senate, got that briefing. 
you know. And so I think we have to force and we have to push to have more of a debate and more people in Congress who are looking at these issues and debating them. They're not there. But the second thing is I think we do have to go back to a better um, um, due diligence by Congress and their oversight role. And I think when you pull earmarking out, I think that was a hugely detrimental thing. If we went back to some of those systems you were talking about, um, Congress wouldn't have the authority today to go back and say to the Navy or the Air Force, hey, we need you to be looking at this. You know, I, I look at the Chinese missile, Mark, that you talked about. I mean, I, I wouldn't have the capability today to put that Ten, fourteen million dollars in, say, go find the fix. And I think everybody sitting around this room today say, "My gosh, we're glad we started that a few few years ago." So, so I think that's the world we need to move forward and and continue to realize it's always been a rubbing. That's okay, though. That's good, but we just need to make sure we're having the people doing the rubbing. And and I don't see as many of them as I used to. We need more of this dialogue. I mean, you're doing a wonderful job of it right here for us today. But for, 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 for men of my profession, we, we're timid. We tend to be timid. We don't, we're afraid of you guys. Well, let me tell you. We don't talk enough. Well, my, my guys over there, uh, they're, not, they're not passionate about this. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want you to think I've got a whole team that's sitting over there that love to come over here and talk to you uh, because they get running in their lanes. And, and that frightens me, you know, because we should work on that, though. Mr. We will. We will. Good. Well, thank you guys so much for letting me uh, be with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.